Hi everyone and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn. Hey, I'm Christina. Welcome. And we are a part of the nightlife team at Cal Academy in San Francisco, which is where I am right now. Um, nightlife is our weekly Thursday night events where we mix science with cocktails, live music, and more. We are officially back in person as of last month. Um, so please drop by if you get the chance. Um, night School, which is what you're watching right now, is our virtual version born out of the pandemic where we bring a little nightlife home to you. Uh, for tonight's program, we're getting a little peek into cave systems that only the most skilled researchers, cave divers, and technology can reach. Um, so, first up, get ready for some incredible visuals. We've had some, some really great previews um, with research scientist Nick Kristoff because he works with scientists, artists, designers, and technologists to peek into dark bat-filled caves with lasers, 3D models, thermal and high-speed cameras to study these mysterious inhabitants and their biology. And then next up, we have marine biologist Fernando Calderon Gutierrez, who's a PhD student at Texas A&M University. Um, he regularly cave dives in some of the most hard to reach caves on earth, subterranean estuaries or underwater caves on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, where species have to adapt to an extreme lack of light and food. So, Great program. Um, as always, tonight's program is live. So say hi, let us know where you're watching from. Hello to everyone watching at Science Today in the building. Um, let us know if it's your first time joining us or your night school regular. Uh, we'll have Q and A's after Nick and Fernando's talk. So make sure to get your questions in. And with that, we will now turn it over to Nick. Thank you, um, Christina and Lynn. Um, please let me know if there is a problem with the sound. We seem to be um, live. Um, I am also greeting everyone who might be joining us tonight or watching the recording um, later. I'm specifically sending a shout out to folks who are uh, tuning in from the East Coast or any of the time zones ahead. It is 22.00 Eastern Daylight Time in North Carolina, which is where I am uh, joining uh, from. And uh, I must say, I am really happy to join the California Academy of Sciences uh, program. In general, we like to share the science that we do and the knowledge that we generate to broader audiences. But tonight feels even more special because this is my time. This is the time that our teams and many members over the years have collected virtually all of the uh, kind of data and information that I'm gonna share with you. And we don't get a chance to go to school after dark. So we're particularly excited to be underground and uh, after dark uh, with you tonight. Um, so what I'd like to do for the next few uh, minutes is take you on a tour through half a dozen or so caves in the South Central uh, US and focus on a line of research rather than uh, a specific uh, project to kind of highlight a style of interdisciplinary work uh, like Lynn and Christina um, mentioned. There is designers, there is biologists, there are artists, technologists that have done this um, line of inquiry and research for a number of, um, of years. I also want to remind us that caves are special places. There is magic there that is difficult to experience anywhere else on the planet. They hold secrets that are left for us to discover. And it's a bit ironic because some of the first signs of human settlements have been recorded in caves, and yet often they are described as the last frontiers left um, on the planet. And so um, as we dip under the surface, I want to remind you that these are parallel worlds that often um, exist at the same time, sometimes merely feet apart. And as our camera is capturing in this uh, case, there's a lot to be discovered and seen um, on the ground. This is kind of the view that I saw 17 years ago when our mentors first brought us in the limestone caves of the hill country of 
Texas. And I can tell you that my passion and my interest for the biology of these creatures, these bats that, uh, that we see hasn't changed. And the more we discover, the more exciting um, it becomes. So I'll take you on a bit of a history of how we tackled some of these questions and what we have learned um, since, uh, since then. So as usual, we started with what's uh, accessible. We started at the front of the caves or near the entrances. We observed as the bats emerged or whatever behavior we could see at, um, at the time. And the questions that we tried to tackle is um, questions that have been around for decades, if not centuries. How many of these bats are there? What do they do during the day and at night when they fly out or when they um, when they uh, return. But one of the, uh, the problems that we have to tackle first is what do you do when it gets dark and you didn't even see the bats? And so we relied on a couple of innovations to tackle these questions. The first one was utilizing uh, thermography or thermal imaging uh, that allowed us to see the bats um, at night. Um, it looks like it's daylight, but this is an image taken in complete darkness. The camera basically recording the different temperatures of bats and the vegetation around the cave. The second innovation was using an interdisciplinary team of biologists and computer scientists, work based at Boston uh, University, that allowed us to use the capabilities of thermal cameras to detect and track bats over time that ultimately allowed us to count them. So the example I'm sharing with you, we count uh, just under 1,700 bats in about 600 frames or so or 10 seconds of real time. And so what we were able to do over the years is we tracked these emergencies in what we call emergence profiles by plotting them uh, uh, over time from six o'clock at night until midnight and recording how many bats per minute emerged for each of these segments. And so if we integrate under the curve, we end up with a total number of bats at that specific location. And I'm gonna show you just a couple of versions of these uh, profiles from literally hundreds that we've collected over the years. So this is the same site in uh, New Mexico, uh, you know, different total number of bats, different profile and different uh, emergence uh, pattern. And uh, a third example, completely different size of the colony and um, very different emergence profile. So over the years, we put these together in these uh, you know, extensive um, data sets. We're able to manipulate the data and look for insights that were not obvious in uh, just looking at individual uh, emergencies. And as we continued to collect data, we realized that we have to push things a little bit further and bring in quantitative modeling that allowed us, amongst other things, to test some historical um, uh, assumptions and predictions about the flight of bats. We were able to simulate their movement using particle dynamics and sort of dial in different number of bats emerging from these structures that we uh, surveyed at the time using kind of classical uh, survey methods. And so in one of these cases, kind of testing um, uh, expectation from a historic estimate at one of these caves, we realized that things don't quite uh, add up and we're able to revisit these historic estimates and correct the uh, uh, colony sizes that were published at the time. We also found that, that there is not a lot of uh, strong correlation between the number of the cave or the site where the bats roost and the size of the colony since we're able to estimate these colonies. And you know, sometimes the largest colony of bats would be roosting in the smallest uh, cave and vice versa, as is the case at Carlsbad, one of the largest cave systems uh, in the world that um, uh, is home to a relatively modest half a million bats or so uh, colony. And we also revisited, um, you know, detailed high-speed recordings of the emergences of the bats, asking the question, well, how do they manage to do that if it's not about the size of the cave? And sometimes really big colonies fly out and roost in really small caves. And to do that, we employed um, um, kind of quantitative analysis of biomechanics of flight uh, in bats. This is work that was done at Brown University collaborative between fluid dynamics engineers and um, morphologists and biologists. And to really answer that question, we had to dial in and study very carefully the flight of an individual bat before we could go and look at how multiple of them. 
And I realized that to this point, I had not introduced the species um, yet. This is the relatively well-known famous Mexican free-tailed bat, which is really a Brazilian free-tailed bat, if you ask the scientists. And just to be um, scientifically correct, introduce its um, scientific name as well. Nevertheless, for our purposes, we're just gonna call it free-tailed bat and show you how if we study their flight, this is the same individual flying at two different speeds, we can gain insight about what is it that changes in their flight performance and perhaps understand how they can do it when they fly in a group. We develop models where in a virtual environment, we sort of created these Frankenstein creatures where we have overlaid and synchronized in time the movement of the same individual flying at these two different speeds. And because it's in virtual environment, we can rotate it and look at it from um, any direction. But more importantly, if you notice, there is not a lot changing in the movement of these wings between these different uh, speeds. So we are able to extract even additional data from these models, kind of creating a kinematic um, uh, kind of history or shadow uh, that represents uh, with even more detail what the bats are doing. The challenge for us is essentially that what the bats are doing is if we as humans shuffle and run and sprint with very little movement, uh, difference in movement in our feet. And obviously we don't do that. So the question is how do bats um, do it? Studying their biomechanics, studying their fluid dynamics, we're able to return to the group flights and study in even more detail um, the emergence um, and the kind of group behavior of these um, of these bats. I'm gonna play a couple of frames here to point something that um, kind of caught us by surprise when we got to this point. So I'm gonna stop this for a moment. I'm gonna focus your attention in this portion of the screen and notice how these two bats interact here over a few, a few frames. As they come in focus, um, and I'm gonna actually backtrack and um, do a recap of this specific interaction. It's kind of different from what people were expecting to that point. I mean, the hypothesis was that they're such skillful and amazing flyers that they never really uh, contact or crash into each other. That's quite not the case um, here. I mean, we see that this um, that sort of catches up with the one in front of it, gets caught under its wing, completely gets disoriented, and somehow miraculously in the next wing beat returns the favor with a slap on the face of the original um, bat. Um, I'm gonna remove the, um, the um, highlight and just kinda watch you, um, see, let you see a few more of, um, of these. The more we uh, observe these, the more interactions and, and contacts we uh, observed. And so what we realized is that bats don't avoid uh, each other uh, in these emergencies because they don't have to. And sort of the, um, the example, the analogy we can uh, think about is when leaving the movie theater, we can certainly leave you know, this crowded environment without touching anyone or having anyone else touch us. You can be very careful. You could shout and say, listen, everyone, please don't touch me. I really wanna get out of this building without a single contact. We can do it, it's gonna be weird, um, but we don't have to, right? There is not that much of a cost if we run into people or they run into uh, into us. And so kind of that change of frame, and um, I just noticed a whole bunch of, uh, of these crashing into each other. That's kind of, uh, you know, reframing of the expectation and the understanding of the system is um, quite helpful. So the last thing that I wanna share with you from this line of research is eventually we realized that to understand the biology of bats, we need to understand where they live and what's special or different about it. And um, I wanna point out some you know, incredible work that's been done in this, um, uh, you know, in this domain over the years. So these are basically maps of caves. So I'm, I'm showing you the caves that we have worked uh, in that have been done by incredibly uh, talented artists and kind of crafty people who survey these caves and um, generate these tiny little drawings that then get fleshed out with these incredibly detailed and artistic representations. And so I'm gonna bro uh, blow one of these um, up. This is James River Bat Cave in the Hill Country of Texas. We're gonna put it in the appropriate um, kind of visual style of after dark and underground. And what we see is quite a bit of detail, but it's in general, it's hard to represent a three-dimensional structure in a two-dimensional uh, environment. 
And so if you're at the site and you have the, the map, you can get a decent sense about where to go, perhaps where not to go. But if you really want to get detailed information about surface areas and volumes and cross-sectional areas, it's going to be relatively difficult to do that. And that's the point when we realize that we need kind of the next step in, um, in serving these environments. And we um, um, sort of employed a, a technology which is called LiDAR that allows um, an instrument to scan um, the surface or the volumes of spaces in stunning accuracy. Uh, you know, these are millions to billions of points, very accurately positioned in space. At times, the most that the error could be in this estimate is just a couple of millimeters over a hundred min, uh, meter distance. So just really stunning, high resolution spatial representations. And once you do that, you sort of have your personal model of this cave on your desktop and you can rotate it, slice it, take it apart, put it together and do just about anything you want. It's truly fascinating. Um, kind of three-dimensional rich survey. You can scan multiple caves. Um, I'm showing you another survey of the largest uh, cave of, um, of a known colony of Brazilian free tail bats in North America, and quite likely the world. This is Bracken Cave, just north of San Antonio, Texas. It is essentially kind of a slightly inclined tunnel underground that leads to a natural dome that eventually was connected with an artificial shaft when humans started um, uh, exploring the guano accumulations uh, from thousands of, um, of years. We can also take virtual tours through these caves and understand that this is kind of uh, pixelating on the screen, but believe me, it looks absolutely stunning on the computer. And so we are able to take a flight in a way that the bat would through Bracken Cave um, with uh, its multi-million bat um, colony. As you can imagine, sort of, you know, fascinating tours is not the only thing on our list. We also um, are asking some quantitative questions. And so if we were able in the last decade and a half to estimate the size of these colonies using thermography and computer vision, there are a lot of reasons why we might not want to do this outside of the caves and do it inside um, the cave. And so using LIDAR, using a new analytical method called subtractive volume estimation, we are beginning to lay the steps and kind of the workflow development that um, allows us to do that. Now, I'm just gonna give you a brief example of work that's happening uh, as we speak. I'm gonna take you quickly to a very special place. It is a conservation and educational ranch in the Hill Country of Texas called the Silla Bamberger Ranch that for the last 50 years has been doing some you know, tremendous um, you know, research, science and education uh, work. The ranch is famous for many things, but one of them is that it has its own artificial bat cave. They call it a chiroptorium, and it was the only one in the world when it was built in the mid 2000s. And to my understanding, it remains the only one at that scale. You can walk inside, it's big enough. You can actually drive a truck and load up the guano if you're interested in using it as a fertilizer, which the ranch people do. This is what it looked like. It was a series of domes when it was constructed in the mid 2000s. And as you can imagine, it's sort of a semi-artificial laboratory-like structure. So we have uh, scanned it, we have modeled it. And if you just kind of sit back and brace for this uh, spinning experience, I'm gonna take you through a couple of steps that we use to model that. So from the LiDAR scans, we develop the models with and without the bats. I'm gonna pause here to show you that we can detect individual bats as well as uh, dense clusters of mini bats together. As you can imagine, if we can separate them visually, then we can separate them um, in space and volume as well. So what we are left is the mass of all the bats in the chiroptorium. And through a little bit of additional math, not too complicated or difficult, we estimated there's 174,000 bats at the time when we scanned. Sort of pausing for a second and kind of pulling back from that dark underground world, we can ask the question, why does this matter and what do we do with it? And as most of us intuitively know, the challenges that we face in different worlds help us solve challenges that we face in our own world on the surface. So here is a bit of a preview of a couple of applications of, of that technology and analytics. Believe it or not, we can model this tree. It's a ginkgo tree. It's exactly 17 years old. And I know that because I planted it. And scanning it and using subtractive volume estimation, we can separate the leaves 
and actually estimate how many leaves does a 17 year old tree have. I'm gonna let you take some guesses in the comments section. Using the same approach, we just completed a terrific project with the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service and partners in Mexico, um, studying the population sizes of monarch butterfly colonies there. So for this tree, we can image the, uh, the colonies with uh, and without the tree or the, the butterflies. We can separate them. And yet again, we know exactly how many butterflies are in this specific tree, likewise for an entire colony. And the last example I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna take you to um, central uh, Maine, state of Maine. This is a hundred year old bridge at the Acadia National Park's famous carriage roads. We can use the same technology to lay the, the beginning steps of how we can monitor any uh, shifts in this um, kind of historical structure that might be happening because of human use or uh, climate change or all of the um, kind of um, challenges that um, that are placed on these old, um, old structures. Um, one of the things that um, I want to leave you with is a bit of a sense into what does it take for the people who do this work. I sort of showed you the end results of it, but not much of um, what do we look like when we go in the caves and um, what does it feel like once, uh, once you're inside. And so I'm going to take the last two minutes to share with you a snippet of a film that we were fortunate to have selected for uh, Mountain Film Festival um, last year. I will never forget when my advisor first showed me a cave of Brazilian free bats. All of this was just like this mess of, a, of an experience. Seventeen years of working there, it's like I know exactly what's what's in there. And if you overcome the heat and the stench and the creepy crawly stuff all around you, and boots getting stuck in the shit and all that stuff, if you overcome that, then there's so much to see there. Strangely. I was terrified as a kid of the darkness. Just like terrified, like dysfunctionally terrified. Dark is is my my space, my time. And the fact that most people still find it creepy and uncomfortable just emboldens me and makes me even happier and more comfortable there. And such is the case that we often celebrate what um, knowledge we generate, um, but rarely do we pay attention to the trajectory of, um, of individuals. And so um, we found that by sharing these kind of personal stories, it was um, interesting for people to, um, to understand that. And the other thing that we don't usually get a chance to celebrate, it seems so much of this work was sort of one person presenting, one person done. This is absolutely not the case. I simply would not have enough time tonight to list all the people and organizations who have participated in this work. And so instead I point you to one of our signature projects that um, we have very passionately developed over the last um, half decade or so, taking all of this information in all of these methods and styles and sharing them with the public. So check out iSwoop at iswoopparks.com and there's a lot more to see and experience there. I'm really looking forward to Fernando's part and I'll be happy to take any questions now or later. Hi, Nick. Um, that was so cool. Um, great visuals. 
which we already prompted. Um, so first question is from Margo, who is four and a half years old. Uh, how far can a bat fly? So, you know, keep in mind that the, when we say a bat, we're talking about, you know, over 1400 species right now. So some bats fly pretty close by to what they call home and some can fly really far away. So the species that I showed you with the really pointy wings and, uh, you know, really stable flights, that one can go for 20, 30, sometimes 50 miles per night. But also these bats migrate seasonally. So in those cases, they will fly hundreds of miles to get to their winter destination. So pretty far, they're really good flyers overall. Cool. Um, Deanna asks, what causes some of the bat groups to be large in smaller caves and moderate groups in larger caves? So that was one of the kind of uh, big questions getting into that, uh, that line of work. As far as we understand it now, and we've moved the bar a little bit over the years, but we still don't have uh, you know, the full simple answer. It's It has to do with um, the conditions of the cave, how warm it is, how cold it is, how humid it is, when in the season, how easy it is for predators to get there. And that's why eventually we went to studying the shape and, you know, the detailed formation of these caves, because a lot of these things are a function of that. Is there a dome? It's going to be warmer and relatively more protected. If it's relatively simple and kind of easy to access for the predators, not a good place for mini bats to to boost. Um, other than lidar, what was the other computer technology you used to map the caves? We have used anything from kind of traditional survey methods. Uh, they're called LRODs. It's an acronym and stands for left, right, up, and down. It's been used for many many decades, and it's really robust. Uh, a lot easier than uh, LIDAR to do. And it, for most cases, it kind of does a pretty good job of finding out where the tunnel or the corridor is um, is going, what the general uh, kind of topography of the cave is. But you cannot get these really detailed models that allow us to do the more complicated and advanced um, uh, kind of analytics. And so, as usual, we use the tool that we need for the specific job. So anything from classic cave surveying to LIDAR. And also keep in mind, when we started with LIDAR 15 years ago, it was cutting edge. Now you can do it with your phone. And uh, if I had some time, I could show you some examples of, of those models. So next time you go into a cave, bring your phone along and keep scanning. Um, there's so many questions, Nick. Uh, let's do this one from Sharon. How many species of bat roost together? The ones that we've seen, so again, tremendous variation in the United States, in your own neighborhood likely, and certainly around the world. So in the species that we work with, mostly in, in North America, we've seen you know, a couple quite regularly. Um, you know, they have very different biologists. Um, some of the bats will just kind of you know, emerge from the cave, kind of flood around and stay relatively close to the ground. The other species, the free tail bats, they fly out and you, know, you won't see them for several hours. They're out high into the clear uh, air, uh, air. So certainly a couple, you know, three, but they're also solitary roosting bats, which want nothing to do with any other species or even species or individuals from their own uh, species. So tremendous variation there, just like people. That's what I was thinking too. I was like, oh, that sounds like humans. Um, how is the species doing? Are there any threats to the cave habitats that you study? Yeah, very, uh, very active um, line of uh, research, a lot of concern. Uh, many of you might have heard about white nose syndrome that's been um, playing out on um, kind of started in the east of the United States and spreading through most of the country, um, you know, decimated uh, millions of bats from several species. And certainly as the, the fungus and the disease has moved west across the United States, and it's beginning to be detected in South Central US where free tail bats are, there's a lot of concern about all the species there as well. So we continue to monitor closely and um, you know, with the hope and nervousness at the same time. So, so far they're okay, but it's, it's only the beginning. Yeah. Um, Tim asked, do the bats become accustomed to your presence over time? 
Um, bats are, you know, as wild animals, they're incredibly smart from our perspective. They're very trainable. And the more I worked with them over the years, the more I realized that they're kind of like tiny puppies with, um, with wings. Um, in the lab environments for these videos and examples that we're able to share with you, that kind of trainability and ability to connect and work with them is really important. You should keep in mind that these are wild animals. You should never touch them in the wild. There are diseases um, like uh, rabies, as we have um, heard in the past year, um, potentially COVID. So always treat them with respect. But in general, they're very trainable if they're properly handled in a laboratory setting and just really clever and intelligent um, you know, mammals. So in the caves, we take great care to not disturb them, to not get too close if we have to get in to be out very quickly. So it's difficult to tell in those settings because our goal is to be in and out as quickly as possible and not give them a chance to do that. Um, this one's from Tara. Um, Accelerated climate change is becoming more evident. What effects have you noticed on the bats in more recent years, if any? Yeah, really interesting question. Like how can we keep up with uh, all that's changing? So just to give you a sense, when I was a graduate student um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, I uh, worked at the University of North Carolina. And for the species that um, I studied, I had to go to Texas or south to South Carolina or even Georgia. In just 15, 20 years, that species is not only all around me here in North Carolina, they're far beyond to the north as well. So tremendous change in the distribution maps and range of these species. Certainly we know about changes of uh, individual colonies and effect on individual species. So you can see those um, effects on a very personal basis in your own work with the individuals and the species you work, as well as sort of at a larger scale, um, as I mentioned, white nose syndrome, and as we saw COVID in the last year. Yeah. All right, um, we have some quick questions. Um, did you give the answer to the leaf question by chance? I haven't, do we have any guesses? Nothing coming in yet, but while while we see if there's any answers, um, are people able to watch the After Dark film online? Um, that was a really good uh, question. And so we knew that we had to be careful with it last year because of its premiere on Mountain Film. Uh, we believe that we're free to share it. And so we will look into that in the next couple of days and post it on icewalkparks.com if that is the case. So I can't give you the immediate answer, but I understand that I sort of set you up with a teaser and, and uh, you should, and I hope that you get to see the whole film. Yeah, if you're interested, just be on the lookout. Um, we have some answers. Uh, so we got 30 million leaves, 25,000 leaves. Um, there was 150. What's the answer, Nick? And so these, these very much capture what people think. We felt the same challenges uh, when we approached bats. People thought from tens of millions to just a couple of of thousands. So the answer in that very special 17-year-old ginkgo tree in Western North Carolina is just under 10,000 leaves. Wow. Um, okay, last question. Well, it's a two-parter, but do you have a favorite bat or and or what's your favorite thing about bats? Um, I do have a favorite bat. Her name was Chica, and we worked together in the lab, uh, you know, just under 20 years ago. Uh, she's the first bat that showed me that, um, uh, you know, bats like mammals are very trainable and you can do amazing things by essentially collaborating. I think that's what training an animal uh, is uh, about. And sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, what is your favorite thing about bats? Um, I feel like uh, my interest in them is endless. Um, I kind of stumbled into bats by accident. Uh, in my uh, undergraduate years when I was looking for research experience, I had signed up for all of these studies and none of them picked me up. And believe it or not, the only study that was left was about bats. And I remember thinking, what is there about bats? They, they're active at night. I don't like the dark. They're tiny. I was a photographer already. And I was like, you can't even take a picture of them. And imagine how much my life was changed that summer. I know, look at you now. 
enjoying the dark much more. Um, well, thank you so much, Nick, for joining us. Uh, this was this was great and a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having you. Thanks. Um, up next, we have uh, Fernando. Hi, good night. Who is everyone? I am really happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And also thanks uh, to Nick for the presentation. It is really nice uh, to see first uh, about these caves on land. And now I will have the opportunity to be talking with you about caves that are completely underwater. So this is a project that I have been working on for more than 10 years now and um, you will see it's a lot of people that has been helping me so as you see so this in this case i will be talking about the subterranean estuary and most of the people uh knows the stories this amazing ecosystem that have the transition from the fresh water into the salt water and we have this horizontal transition that as we move we will have more and more salinity sal salinity and we actually have some really unique species as the mangroves however in some uh karstic regions that are these coastal areas where the sediment is calcium carbonate you will find that there are not rivers on the surface what is happening is that the rocks in here has a really high porosity and this means that the water is just going through the rocks naturally the water has some co2 so it's a little bit acidic and it starts dissolving the rocks from underground and because of this uh, we have the formation of a lot of caves just to give you an idea how the underwater story story is or also known as ankylin ecosystem we have the division here but rather than having and a smooth horizontal transition, we have a really step uh, division. What you can see here using the upper water layer is fresh water. This line in here, we call it halocline. And then below we have completely marine water. So it is used like oil and water, they do not mix. Other thing that we can see here is that uh in this case the water is really really clear so what this is showing us is that there is not a lot of particles in the water so there is not a lot of food there is not a lot of things but water so the first question is uh how to know where the caves are and in this case what we look for are for the cenotes or sinkholes but this, in this case, it's important to know that a cenote doesn't necessarily mean a cave. There will be some caves that will not have any entrance. And there will be others that will have several. So it's just like talking about windows and doors of a building. Knowing how many doors do you have doesn't really tell you how many caves are around. But uh, we currently know more than 2,000 cenotes in the Yucatan Peninsula, and it is estimated that there are more than 5,000. And interesting, you can see that in the center of the Yucatan Peninsula, so Campeche doesn't have a lot of them. And it is just because this area is just jungle. It's really, really hard to enter to these sections to do some exploration. Just to give you an idea, this is the map of one of the caves. This is Sakatun, and it's the longest underwater cave uh, worldwide. It is a couple of kilometers south of Cancun. And in this case, it's 360 kilometers long. So that's over 200 miles. And as you can see, the yellow dots are different cenotes. So you can actually start diving in different places. And even in here is a direct connection with the ocean. So in this case, you can actually start diving in the ocean, go inside of the cave, and then go far inland as long as you can. So these caves can be huge. 
However, because we do not have light, also, as you saw in the video, the quantity of food is really limited. Also, when we are looking at oxygen, in some cases, it can be near to zero. And we have uh, other stuff like hydrogen sulfide that makes this environment really extreme for the life. And because of this, we find that most of these populations will be really small. And a lot of the species are endemic. It is common that we will have entire species that only lives in a single cave or only a few caves. But it is not just extreme for the life itself. It is also extreme to do research in here. So the first thing we need to do is just to arrive to the case. And for this, sometimes we need to be just walking on the jungle, carrying with all the equipment. Uh, the disadvantage that we have here is that they are completely filled of water. So we need to carry as much air as we want to breathe. And this limits a lot the time that we can spend inside of these caves, especially if these caves are deep. So when we are diving, again, because there is no light, we need to carry uh, a lot of lights. We also need to be careful not to get lost inside of the cave, because if not, uh, we may not be able to find the exit. And in these cases, it's also really important to understand that if we have been diving for one hour inside of the cave, if we want to go back, we need to dive one hour or even more to be able to go out. So we need to be very careful. It requires a lot of training, a lot of uh, equipment. And this is one of the bigger challenges. You need uh, people who is has all the training as a K-diver, but also all the training as a researcher. So as you can see in this picture, I am using two tanks on my back and another in here. It is not rare that I will be using uh, four tanks, but I will never be with less than two. So just to give you an idea, this is uh, one cave that is really narrow. So in this case, you can see that the divers actually have the tanks on the sides. And it's because they will not fit with the tanks on the back. And in some cases, we need to even remove the tank and push it in front of us to be able to fit. Some cases, this is only for a small section, but other times is like for most of the cave. So again, we need to be really comfortable. We need to have really good training. So for a lot of time, people was like, OK, in the caves, there is no light. Therefore, there is no photosynthesis. If we do not have photosynthesis, there is no food. So there is not life that is fully adapted to the caves. We will have a lot of orangings like bats that live in the caves, but then they go out to it. Or we will have some organisms that just fall inside of the cave and they will not survive in there. However, we have found that there are a lot of species living in these caves. So just in the Yucatan Peninsula, we currently know over 100 species from 10 different phyla. And most of them are crustaceans, but we also have sponges, we have echinoderms, even vertebrates with some examples of fishes. There are some special taxa that worth noticing. Like for example, the Clashromipedia, the whole class that is a really high taxa for biology classification has only been found inside of caves, mainly in the Caribbean, including Mexico, but also we have them in caves of the Canary Islands and then Australia. Why this distribution, we really do not know yet. The other thing uh, with the Rhymy pets is that they allow us to better understand the evolution between crustaceans and insects. In the other hand, we have a lot of species that have some type of connection with the deep sea. So in this case, I am showing you just three examples. This sponge in here is actually a carnivorous sponge. It's probably the most extreme uh, case because it is a species that is living in 
the ocean at thousands of meters deep. And then in case of the Mediterranean, at just 10, 15 meters deep. We do not know if the populations are connected or not, but we know that it is the same species. In the case of Mexico, we have this orange species here. It is uh, in case of in two caves of Cosmo Island. And then in the ocean, again, we will find it at 200 meters deep. And finally, we have other cases like this worm that has only been observed inside of caves, but all the sister species are only found in the deep sea. So again, how this, the shallow case with the deep sea is connected, we still do not know, but we know that there is some type of connection. It could be an active connection or it could be something that just happens as the sea level moves. So to be able to look at the fauna, there are uh, several methods. Two of the most common ones is just to graph a plankton net. And in this case, the diver will be just uh, moving the plankton, trying to filter as much water as possible. And this will allow us to capture really small organisms that we will not be able to see to the naked eye. And then we can see on the microscope once in the lab. There are other organisms, and as the case of the sea star and also that sponge that are big enough that we can just uh, directly collect. And when we have been like sampling these organisms, one thing that we find out is that we have a lot of species to discover, like really a lot. Just in the past year, uh, we described seven new species of sponges from caves in Mexico. And these currently are the only cave adapted species of sponges in Mexico that we know. These six species are living only in a single cave and this other is living in another cave. We have been looking in caves around and we haven't found them. So we are pretty confident that these species are endemic. Meaning that if something happened to this cave, it will be the end of the entire species. And to do the identification of these sponges, we mainly use the electronic microscopy to be looking at speckles that are bone like structures that are like these ones in here that you can see that have different shapes and different uh, sizes. And some of them are really beautiful, like little stars. Others are quite simple. But these ones are actually smaller than the thickness of a uh, human hair. When we are looking at the work of other uh, research groups, something that we find is the same pattern. There are a lot of new species that have been recently described. And not just sponges, we also have echinoderms that is really weird to see in caves. Currently, there are less than 10 species of echinoderms worldwide in caves. And most of these studies have been done just looking at the morphology. Know that we are also looking at the genetics, we are finding even more species. So literally, if you go to a new cave, most likely you will find a species that have not a name. But one of the main projects I have been working on has been the ecological monitoring. And in this case, I is literally taking a picture of the cave, but with numbers. So in a 15 meter square area, I am counting and measuring all the organisms. And this allows us to do comparisons of the community structure. But more importantly, it allows us to do the estimation of the population size and also to be looking what the trend is. If these populations are declining, if they're stable or what is happening. Remember that one of the main limitations we have is that we cannot be longer than as much air we have in the tanks. So there is a lot of things that can be done in other environments that we do not have the opportunity to do. And something that we have found is two very distinct type of species. In this case, both of these species are endemic to a single cave. And you can see how this uh, 
si es dark copy duster cavernicola has less than 300 individuals this is natural it doesn't mean that we have been uh, killing this species this just means that naturally because there is not a lot of food a lot of energy in this ecosystem the population is small and this is uh, something really common with a lot of the species but then somehow we have this ophiroid or pure star that has been able to adapt very well and the population is around 300,000 organisms again in a single cave and with these you will think okay there are a lot they are not really vulnerable but actually they are so if you remember that they are in a single cave it doesn't matter how many they are if something happened to this cave the entire species will disappear Something that was really unexpected is that we saw that the rain can actually affect the fauna inside of the underwater caves. So it was a week of really heavy rain in Cozumel. It was not even a hurricane or something like that. It was just heavy rain for a week that it was actually flooded and we were not able to go to the field. And when we finally were able to go, we saw that the haloplane was five meters deeper. So a lot of the sections of the caves, we found that the marine water disappeared. And because of that, a lot of the organisms just died or were really affected. Then when we are starting comparing uh, different populations, we find that some species that are reef species that have an stable population inside of the cave, either disappeared or the population was seriously affected. In other cases, we found a species of fully cave adapted fauna where they were really resilient and their population has been stable. Now, in this case, we need to be careful because again, a lot of the species from the reef are no longer in the cave or the population is really really reduce it and we do not understand what the interaction is between fully cave adapted species with organisms that are coming from other populations so we do not know if they were providing food if there was some kind of symbiosis or if it was some type of uh, predation even so probably this is something that we will be able to see how what it happens in 10 or 20 years, as we can see uh, monitoring data in the future. And yes, we need to recognize that extinction is natural. However, what is not natural is all the ways that the human is used pushing the environment. For the caves, the biggest challenge is the sea level change. So in this case, I am showing you here just 20,000 years ago that talking about geological time and evolution time is talking about yesterday. The sea level was 120 meters below the current uh, sea level. So with this, uh, we know that the species needs to be able to move from the caves that we know currently to caves that are in other layers. And we know that most of the caves that we have been working on were uh, completely dry. And this is because when we are looking at these cave formations, all the stalactites and stalagmites, they were only formed when the cave is dry. They do not form with water. And also, uh, we have found a lot of archaeological objects of human remains also. And they are sometimes really inside of the caves. And this is just because, again, a couple of thousand years ago, the sea level was a little lower. So the human was able to just walk because it was a dry cave. And probably they were just looking for water. But uh, for something that is just short term and we can just affect a population in even a couple of days is fierce with the trash. In this case, you can see that the entrance of this cave is just a pile of trash. Even the water here looks green. 
because the water quality is really bad. We do not understand how this is affecting the fauna, but for sure it is affecting it. Also, a lot of people will just uh, fill the cenotes because they want to build something. And something really important to understand is that most of the fauna entering, most of the food entering into these caves comes from outside. So from that connection with the ocean and also from these cenotes, just like all the leaves and everything that falls inside. So we are literally just closing the doors of the food delivery. Also, we just have uh, the development of cities without knowing that there is a cave. And in this case, in this uh, circle is the area of one of the main caves. And you can see that the city is just growing, but also there is a new cardboard just above the cave. How this affects, still, we do not know. And the main problem is that again, some of these species are endemic to a single cave. It has been sad. Sometimes we are just diving and we find this PVC pipe just entering inside of the cave. And this is just wastewater. So if you can see this layer here, this is uh, hydrogen sulfide. And literally this is both really bad for the fauna living in this case, but also for the population of humans because Again, there is not fresh water just in the surface. So all the water that we use for human consumption and for all the human activities in these regions is underground. So we are literally putting a pipe from the bathroom directly into the potable water. And then we do not know how many caves this happens, but we know that this little fish, Astianas fasciatus, that lives in the cenote, but using the area with the light, has learned that cave divers have really good lights and they just follow the divers and start eating all of these blind cave adapted fauna that do not know how to defend themselves from these fishes. So every time you see this fish moving really quick, it is just eating a small cave adapted crustacean. But the biggest risk in the caves is that we do not know a lot of, about them. And if we do not know where they are, it is impossible to do research. If we do not know where they are and what is living there, it is impossible to do a good conservation effort or also to create the cities in a more friendly way so we can uh, share this planet with the cave fauna. And again, this is a project that has been thanks to a lot of institutions and a lot of people, especially with uh, the help of a lot of cave divers that are doing all the exploration of this region. So if you have any question. Um, thank you so much, Fernanda. I'm this is fascinating. Um, I think people learned a lot from you. So thank you. Um, it's a lot of questions kind of in two sections about like cave diving and then about the organisms that you find in the caves. So I'm going to go with organisms first. So, um, a user named toughen up fluffy, um, asks what the heck do these critters eat? So as I mentioned, a lot of the food will just enter through the cenotes and this can be just like leaves, organic matter, but mm -hmm. there is actually a uh, chemiosynthesis. So we have photosynthesis on land where the plants are taking the energy of the sun to produce food in the caves. And also this happens also in deep sea and other environments. We have bacteria that use the energy from chemical compounds to create mm -hmm. food. Okay, great. Um, and that little fish that you were showing at the end who loved your light, um, does a fish like that live in the cave full time or does it just go in to feed on all the poor blind shrimp? So like, do you find fish in these caves? There are some fishes that are adapted, uh, mm -hmm. but these fishes will be blind. In the case of these fish, 
it only lives in the cenote, so just in the area where we have the lights. Okay. But it needs the light to be able to see the prey. Mm -hmm. So, and they are really big populations of these. For the ones okay. that are cave adapted, like you will be diving for one, two hours and probably you will see one. Oh, wow. And for okay. this one, once I was diving and we saw like 20, 30 that were following us. <laughs> yeah, so they ate well that day. Um, and then, uh, so that fish looked pretty small, but what's the largest, largest organism that lives in these caves? So again, because we have really limited food, most of the mm -hmm. organisms are going to be really small. Mm -hmm. And that is why we use the plankton nets. So literally for very small organisms. Uh, the giants in terms of crustaceans are going to be like four, 10 centimeters. But mm -hmm. right now the biggest organisms are sponges. Okay. Uh, and in ca some cases we have sponges that are like even 30 40 centimeters but it's because they are just filtering the water and also sponges are weird organisms it is like you can actually cut the sponge and then you will have two sponges mm -hmm. yeah cool um uh let's see um oh well, here's interesting from anastasia asks do you think studying underwater cave organisms can provide insight to some of the earliest living organisms? Yes, and there is people that is actually doing it. Uh, so for that, it happens a lot in dry caves. Mm. And people is just starting to do it also in underwater caves. Most of the time, uh, they will just make a hole and then pump water and they will be looking uh, for bacteria. Again, the main problem that we have when we are diving in a cave is that we need to carry our own air. So a mm -hmm. lot of the studies that we want to do, we just need to make sure that we have enough time to, to do it. Like in a dry cave, people actually camp inside of the caves. Uh, in an underwater cave, there is people that is using equipment that looks like the astronaut, uh, what an astronaut will use and they can be like for eight hours underwater. Wow. But like still eight hours is really limited, especially if the site that you are interested is mm -hmm. at four hours from the entrance. <laughs> like you need to arrive yeah. first there. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, and then uh, this is a good question. So when you take, um, when you're collecting species from the caves, um, how do they survive in labs to study them? Like, do they, do you have a limited amount of time that they can survive in labs or do, can you reproduce the conditions pretty well? Yeah, this is actually, actually we need to be really careful with. Uh, mm -hmm. If we take 10 organisms for a species that has only 300, yeah. we may be able affecting the species. So we try to only take a few. Mm -hmm. uh, and this actually limits a lot the type of studies that we want to do. Like for population genetics, it is common to need a couple of hundred organisms. We do not always have them. Yeah. Uh, but most of the time we will sacrifice the organisms to be able to work with them. There mm -hmm. are only a few studies that were, they have been able to uh, have the organisms in an aquarium for a couple of months. But also like consider, for example, for the sponges, we were looking at this uh, spicula, so we literally need to do the sections of the sponges to be able to, ident to do the identification. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a really good point that you made that people, um, that's important to say that you're not taking entire populations, you're taking, it's very highly regulated um, and you're taking the ones you need for science and. Um, yeah, like in general, I try to take only one to three organisms if I do mm -hmm. not know the species, if I do not know what the population size, mm -hmm. and then uh, try to take as much information from those. And there's only a few scientists, right, or researchers who can who can do that, right? Yeah, so in this case, yeah. there are uh, 
two groups, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, there is people that will be waiting outside of the caves for the samples and either another researcher or a cave diver that does it for fun, uh, take the sample. In this case, they work in collaboration. They take all the permits and everything before that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the researcher doesn't have the first hand experience of the ecosystem. And especially when you're trying to do ecology, it, that's really important. Yeah. And then uh, there is a people who is crazy enough to just go inside of the caves and then do all the research. So yeah. for the second category, we are just a few. Okay. Um, so cave diving, um, how date, so the one, I think it was the SAC Acton, you said mm -hmm. the system, the longest one, um, compared to other cave systems in the world, how dangerous or how skilled do you have to be to dive in, in that system? So every cave is going to be really different and really particular. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, uh, the good thing about that cave is that it's mainly shallow mm -hmm. and the shallower you are diving, the more time you can be, the more time the air is going to last. And then you have less risk of some uh, diving uh, illness like the compression sickness. But uh, especially that cave, it is really easy to get lost. Mm -hmm. So there have been a lot of accidents where the diver has been lost and that's it unfortunately there are other caves that are small like some of the caves i am diving in and are really complex in terms of diving are only 60 meters long but uh -huh. they are 50 meters deep uh -huh. so in some cases or even more so in some cases we cannot even breathe air we need to use weird mixtures that includes helium in them so mm -hmm. each cave is going to be very different. Uh, what is really important is for everyone who wants to do it, needs to take all the training. Yeah. Actually, like the training for cave diving is more like a survival uh, training, how to go out of the cave more than how to go inside of the cave. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also, um, like, for example, for that uh, cave, it is not something that people do in a single uh, day or in a single. Mm -hmm. So these caves is because people is just mapping and then they find the connection. So that cave mm -hmm. is actually growing because people wow. is ex still exploring. Like right now, probably they are limited to a right so far. And then mm -hmm. they use a scooter. So literally they just like go faster inside of the cave. Or, so as the technology advances, it is allowing us to do more and more. Yeah. Um, has anyone used LIDAR imagery like Nick showed to map these these underwater caves? Or could you use his help with that? As long as I know, there has not been <laughs> LIDAR on underwater Ooh. caves. It will be really interesting. So in here, the main problem will be to calibrate the LIDAR to work underwater. Yeah. Well, first to protect it uh, because electronics doesn't work very well with water. Mm -hmm. uh, they have that tendency. But then also, like in some case, we will have some sediment just in the water, uh, and that will affect the the vision from the laser. Yeah. And one of yeah. the problems is that when you enter, the water is super clear, but when you exhale, like all the bubbles touch the ceiling and will move all the sediment from the ceiling, it will go down. Oh, so interesting. sometimes when you enter, it's just this precious, super crystal clear water. And then you look back and it's like milk. Like you have like really powerful lights and you will not be okay. able to see your hand in front of you. So oh. it will be interesting to try it for sure. I will love to, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was so interesting. And um, I know that you are going to get to go back in the field soon after a year off. So, um, so. <laughs> it's okay. So um, yeah, so, so good luck with that. Um, getting back into the field. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for the invitation for the invitation and 
for yeah. everything. Yeah. All right. Let's get Lynn back here on the screen to wrap up the night. Hi. Hi. How's it going over there? Very bright right now. <laughs> I might be getting sunburnt. Um, but thank you so much, Nick and Fernando, for being on our night school program tonight. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Next week is a fun one. Um, this theme, we've been playing around for, I don't know, like six months. Um, but we're finally doing it. We're doing a down under theme um, and talking about the endemic species of Australia. So we'll have koalas, platypuses, gray-headed flying foxes, and wombat poop. Um, for those that didn't know, wombat poop come in cubes. Um, so find out all about that next week. Yeah. And um, so you should subscribe to our channel um, so you don't miss next week's presentation for the week after or the week after. Um, and yeah, like as you see, nightlife is back in the building. So please come by um, if you're in the Bay Area. And if there is a night and, and you can also watch night school from inside the academy. So you won't have to miss a thing. Um, and for those of you who have been watching a long time, don't know if you care, but next week <laughs> is going to be my last show for a while. I'm having a baby, so I'm going to take some time off, but um, would love for you to join for Down Under. So it's my personal note. Yes, come for Christina's <laughs> mini farewell. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, nothing. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, everyone, for joining us, and um, have a good night.